Because I've been writing about religion, and more recently, I suppose, about politics for a long time. My interest sort of stemming from a fascination with the varieties of religious experience in America, and more recent years, extending to the ways in which certain strands of religious thought in America, particularly politicized fundamentalism in its ability to project a sort of a long shadow uh, over foreign affairs. Our guest today is Jeff Charlotte. Uh, Jeff Charlotte has become the chronicler of American fundamentalism and its role in our nation's public life. Uh, as is the case for many of us, however, his journey has not been straight down the superhighway, but has meandered through city streets and alleys, along country roads, and even through the secret corridors of Washington power. Uh, Jeff Charlotte, now a member of the Dartmouth College faculty and a contributing editor for Harper's and for Rolling Stone, has written, as he says, for a free newspaper that doubled as insulation for the homeless. <laughs> and has... <laughs> and he has also edited the only English-language glossy magazine of Yiddish culture. For several years, he served as the humanities editor at the Chronicle of Higher Education. But with the turn of the century, he accelerated his pursuit of his current interest, American fundamentalism. He published a long piece in Harper's in 2003 titled, Jesus Plus Nothing, Undercover Among America's Secret Theocrats, which told the story of Ivanwald, a house uh, in Arlington that hosted the prayer meetings of a number of powerful members of Congress. Then he co-authored Killing the Buddha, a Heretic's Bible in 2004, a book that grew out of his explorations, again in his words, of the margins of faith, a cowboy church in Texas, a military pagan coven in Kansas, a Pentecostal exorcism in North Carolina. From 2003 to 2009, he taught at NYU's Center for Religion and Media and continued to explore issues of religion in America. In 2008, he published The Family, The Secret Fundamentalism at the Heart of American Power, and most recently, he has published C Street, The Fundamentalist Threat to American Democracy. Please welcome Jeff Charlotte. Thank you, George, for that uh, great introduction. I feel I have to clear things up on that paper that doubled as uh, insulation. Um, uh, doubling would be putting it charitably. Um, that was uh, its, its most effective purpose, a, a freebie called The Resident, uh, which was sort of the, the very, very poor cousin to the village voice. Um, and as I think about all the publications I've worked with over the years, um, there's not often a journalist can just know that their work has had a positive effect in the world. And at the resident, I did. I was keeping people warm, comforting the afflicted. Um, I have, as, as, as George says, I've been writing about uh, religion, um, and, and more recently, I suppose, about politics for a long time. My interest sort of stemming from a fascination with the, the varieties of religious experience in America, and, and more recent years, uh, extending to um, the ways in which certain strands of religious thought in America, uh, particularly uh, politicized fundamentalism, and, and I'll get to the distinction between what we mean when we speak of fundamentalism, but particularly politicized fundamentalism and in, in its ability to project uh, a sort of a long shadow uh, over foreign affairs. Um, but I think I'm here today, uh, the probably what calls me to your attention um, in some ways, I'm indebted to uh, the work of three, uh, three politicians last summer, uh, three Republican politicians, you may recall, all very publicly detonated their marriages, all champions of family values, uh, and, and all pursuing with great uh, vigor and dedication um, some unusual affairs. We had... Um, <laughs> I do not mean to disparage them. Well, actually, I, I'll get to that. There's one that I care to disparage, but uh, uh, Se Senator John Ensign was the first. Remember Senator John Ensign, who was then the fourth-ranking Republican, 
who had perhaps grandiose thoughts of uh, uh, a White House run, um, presidential prospect in his own mind, uh, and then went until he flew home to Las Vegas uh, to confess an affair um, with uh, one of his aides, who was the wife of one of his uh, senior aides, um, and who uh, they were about to go public. So. Um, uh, then we had Governor Mark Sanford, who, who I actually think was really was genuinely a sort of a brighter presidential prospect, um, a very able politician, uh, might have been able to, to, to at least uh, make a, a serious run for president, as he was considering, until, as you recall, he redefined the Appalachian Trail as, <laughs> as going all the way down to Argentina and into the arms of his mistress, and that was it for him. Uh, and then last, and this is the disparaging part, I said last and without much charity in my heart, really least in every way, was an unusually powerful but little known congressman from Mississippi named Chip Pickering. Uh, Pickering, by the way, is important. Pickering may be I've said to have had a bigger impact on American life than, than, than either of these two much better known men. Uh, when, uh, uh, before he was in, in, in Congress as an aide, and he was one of the architects of the 1996 Telecommunications Act. Um, which was a massive privatization of the airwaves, which enabled the sort of the rise of media monopolies like Clear Channel, which uh, was a terrible blow to journalism and free press in America. I bring that up in a, in a talk about religion to emphasize that when we talk about political fundamentalism, it's not always so simple as the social issues that occupy us uh, in, in, in these sort of days of culture war, that there are issues that seem to us to have nothing to do with religion, like the Telecommunications Act. But when we look at the career of someone like Chip Pickering, who also fought uh, unsuccessfully uh, uh, for the broad, uh, Broadcast Decency Act, a um, uh, pretty draconian uh, piece of legislation that didn't pass would have enabled uh, uh, government to take uh, a broadcaster off the air for one naughty word, one time. Um, people thought that was too much, it didn't pass. He shared that with the folks back home in Mississippi. They thought he was fighting for Christian values. Good fight, Chip. Um, meanwhile, the real effort was going into the privatization and deregulation of uh, telecommunications, and particularly the airways, which are public property. Um, and that was experienced as a religious fight, too. The idea of freeing the invisible hand of the market, which the men I'm going to be talking about today really take rather literally as not just the invisible hand of the market, but the invisible hand of God, that in as much as we attempt to regulate the market, uh, we are interfering um, with the sovereignty of God. These are what I call the politics of fundamentalism. And I said I wanted to address the term fundamentalism because before I sort of go further, it's important to uh, emphasize, to remind those not familiar with that word, that fundamentalism is in itself, traditionally, back in the beginning, it's a small d democratic tradition. Um, it is not, uh, in its history, an authoritarian uh, tradition in American life. It's the tradition of people who said, no preacher, no church is going to tell me how to worship God. Um, uh, and if they do, I'm going to walk out down the street and start another church. Um, uh, and you can see that you know, all throughout the country. You see sometimes the church, you know, first this or that, and then down the street, second this or that, and, and you know, multiplying as people over small points of doctrine. Um, that schismatic energy, which is really deeply democratic. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about the politics of fundamentalism, um, the idea that manifests itself um, through a concept of America as a chosen nation, um, a new Israel, in the words of uh, one of the men I'll talk about tonight, um, a, a place with a manifest destiny that we must not uh, just spread throughout the land, but around the world. All three of these guys, uh, Ensign, Sanford, and Pickering, all paid lip service, at least, to that idea, but they were united more than ideologically. Uh, all three scandals were also linked to uh, the red brick townhouse on Capitol Hill. It's at 133 C Street Southeast, uh, across from the Library of Congress, a block away from uh, one of the congressional office buildings down the street from the Supreme Court. Uh, the C Street House, or the Prey Boy Mansion, as some bloggers began to call it, is the Capitol Hill headquarters of the oldest and I think arguably the most influential Christian conservative political organization in Washington, which is known variously as the, fel the Fellowship, the Prayer Breakfast Movement, and to its longtime leader, uh, Doug Coe, uh, as the family. And, uh, oh, let me grab some water here. 
Now, Ensign lived in the C Street house. Um, uh, Sanford retreated there for help uh, as his marriage dissolved. Um, uh, he went there for spiritual counsel, as he, as he said. He sent his wife, Jenny Sanford, there. And, and Jenny describes the, the, count, the spiritual counseling she got uh, at C Street um, uh, from the men of C Street uh, was the idea that she, as their marriage sort of hit the rocks, she should not challenge her husband. She should not express the dissatisfaction. It was not appropriate that he was straying and not being uh, invested in their marriage, but that was a problem to be worked out among men. The brothers of C Street would handle that. In the meantime, in the meantime, she should not feel left out. She had a responsibility. And I should warn you, there's going to be some vulgarity in today's talk. Um, she was to keep the governor sexually satisfied. Because as a leader who had a, a calling, who had a uh, 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 anointing from God, he had great burdens on him, great responsibilities. And uh, she was to make that burden easier. And they, as she testifies, uh, explicitly uh, advised her uh, not to withhold sex from the governor, no matter what. Um, last and least, and it takes something to go beyond that. Um, <laughs> But Chip Pickering had what it took. Um, he not only lived in the C Street house, um, which uh, I should say, by the way, is tax exempt. Um, it, it's registered as a church um, with the IRS. Um, District of Columbia has since revoked that uh, uh, federal taxes uh, still don't apply. Uh, a group of pastors who, for some reason, think C Street gives church a bad name are, are, are trying to challenge that. Um, Pickering uh, actually rendezvoused with his mistress uh, in the church. Um, Pickering, the telecom champion, his mistress was a telecom lobbyist, and he left Congress in 2008 to become a telecom lobbyist. Other residents of the C Street house, all enjoying subsidized rent in a house that this house is tax free. We have Senator Jim DeMint of South Carolina, much in the news these days as the standard bearer, I suppose, of uh, bringing the Tea Party together with the establishment. Senator John Thune of South Dakota, uh, Senator Sam Brownback of Kansas, who was about to become governor of that state as part of his long-term project, um, perhaps grandiose as well, of, uh, of thinking that he could make a, a real run for president. He's going to be, uh, his successor will be a Representative Jerry Moran, uh, another C-Streeter, um, who won in a primary with another C-Streeter, uh, Representative Todd Tehart. So in Kansas, he had a situation, heads, C-Street wins, tails, C-Street wins. Um, we have Representative Zach Womp. Uh, we have perhaps the most outlandish, Senator Tom Coburn, uh, an Oklahoma Republican who is infamous for proposing the death penalty for abortion providers. Uh, he is a doctor himself. Uh, he's also infam infamous for Shanghaiing Senate staffers to show them a slideshow of the, uh, I told you this was going to be vulgar, but this is Coburn's idea, the genital ravages of STDs um, to warn them about the, the, the wages of sin. Uh, now, Coburn, as a doctor, invoked medical confidentiality uh, in, uh, as a defense and why he was not going to talk about the role he had played in C Street's cover-up of Senator Ensign's affair. Uh, Coburn had acted as something of a middleman, uh, um, so it was, um, uh, uh, arranging payments to Ensign's mistress's family. Um, so he said he had medical confidentiality. Um, I think these folks in the front row sort of know the punchline here. Coburn is an obstetrician, so we wait the, the happy announcement from Senator Ensign. Um, now, if all these men, and it is all men, this is a very, not exclusively, but very male-dominated group, if they all want to live together and pray together and seek spiritual guidance and infuse their politics with their faith, absolutely fine. That's what's... The, that, that's the same. That's protected by the same First Amendment that uh, defends my right to speak with you today and, and your right to listen. Um, there's no conspiracy here, and I think that's important to emphasize because sort of a lot of things started circulating in the blog. The same folks are coming up with terms like Preboy Mansion, where sort of drawing all kinds of connections. There's no conspiracy here. There's, these folks are entitled to do this, um, but we as the public and we as journalists are also entitled to ask questions. And we particularly want to start asking questions uh, when we look at this group that um, uh, is, is sort of organizing C Street, um, this idea that here are these guys enjoying uh, subsidized rent, which adds up to a lot of money over the years, um, from a private and very sectarian religious organization. And I should say that raises uh, alarms uh, 
that's not a left-right issue. That's a transparency issue. Um, I mentioned the group of pastors, a group called Clergy Boys out in Ohio, interdenominational group of pastors, which has filed formal complaint with the IRS. Um, they're kind of a liberal group. On the other side of the spectrum, we have a magazine called World Magazine, which is um, perhaps the leading Christian right magazine in the country. Um, invested in journalism. They believe that you can, you can be a fundamentalist and a good journalist, and they've proven it by doing uh, terrific investigative reporting on C Street. Um, and they've done a particularly good job at following the money uh, around C Street, um, which is, of course, uh, a problem when you have uh, uh, an organization um, that, as C Street has done for years until 2009, um, denied that it existed. Um, uh, when this book came out in 2008, I teamed up with uh, NBC Nightly News to do a segment on this, and uh, NBC's producer reached out to one of the leaders of the organization, said, we want to you know, get your perspective on what you're doing. His response was, oh, there's no organization at all. And fortunately, NBC had done their homework, and they said, well, but you have tax records, you have documents. Um, you know, he said, oh, we're just a group of friends. He said, but you have a budget. He says, you know, on, on your tax records, it says $12 million. Uh, for making friends. That's actually a, a line in their, uh, in their tax records. Uh, they need a lot of help. Um, so the question is, why, why this, uh, um, this secretiveness? Why this avoidance of publicity? The longtime leader, Doug Coe, says, the more invisible you can make your organization, the more influence it will have, um, which is, of course, true, um, which is why we have lobbying and disclosure laws, uh, laws in fact, that uh, Another leader of the organization, former Congressman Mark Siljander, uh, ran afoul of when he pled guilty uh, this July to acting as an unregistered lobbyist. He's now facing 15 years in prison, so sometimes the system works. Um, Doug Coe explaining why this is so, wh why he wants to do this, he says, um, uh, he says, they are called upon not to be a broad ministry. This isn't Billy Graham. This isn't the moral majority. Um, but rather, they are called upon to be a ministry for a select few, the elites. Um, uh, uh, what uh, the founder of the group said uh, when describing where, we, where he saw the world, he says, we are entering the age of minority control. And they are called upon to, uh, to minister to that small minority who controls power and, and make the, help them do the right thing. Um, as, and I'll read from uh, Co explaining why this is so. He said, each um, cell, they organize cells, a kind of alarming word. It's not, it's just, it's a, uh, they mean, it just means prayer group, but that's the term they've used. Um, uh, each cell should work behind the scenes. It should have no stationary, no publicity. It's important to note that what God is doing in terms of finances is not visible to the casual observer. Um, well, it was actually visible to uh, World Magazine. Um, uh, because evangelicalism was plagued by televangelist scandals in the 80s, it's developed a really terrific system of accountability for its ministries. Um, and you actually have terrific transparency in and, uh, and much of the evangelical world, and organizations are holding people accountable. Um, and they looked at the finances that are not visible to casual observer, and they said, this raises every red flag in the book. Um, but Co assures you that there's sort of nothing um, nothing too alarming going on. He says, in all cases, the concept remains the same of all these different organizations, all these little nonprofit entities that are, in fact, the same group. What is the concept? The concept, he says, men who are picked by God, men who are picked by God for leadership. So who does God pick and why? What made God think Mark Sanford was a good idea? <laughs> doesn't have a better judgment. And here we run into a, the apparent contradiction, which starts taking us out into the world. Because I do want to emphasize, when we talk about fundamentalism, we so often look at culture wars in America and domestic politics. Um, uh, uh, politicized fundamentalism has long been much more international in perspective. And so do we, who are observers of it, need to be. Um, the, the group itself, it, you know, this is not creeping theocracy or anything like that. In fact, one fundamentalist critic of the organization calls it the religion of the status quo. They say they're into living with what is. Um, on the other hand, there's a peculiar theology, um, quite at odds with what you might find in, in, in really just about any church, I think, that I've ever encountered in years of reporting on religion, a fetishization of strength which grows out of 
the 19th century, a 19th century tradition called muscular Christianity, this idea that, um, that uh, uh, in the late days of the British, or not the late, the days of the British Empire, that churches had become too feminized, that women had too much authority in churches, that men were growing too soft, that they weren't being vigorous, this idea that Christ was not this soft, feminine, kind, loving guy, but he was sort of a warrior, he was a strong man. Um, and this group grows out of that idea and takes it further. Um, back in its early days in the 1930s, when the founder, looking around the world, sees fascism growing strong, communism growing strong, and concludes that democracy cannot compete, um, that democracy is too weak, that there needs to be uh, a third way, and the third way is his kind of muscular Christianity, which he um, uh, then feeds steroids um, in the sense of, uh, one, embracing an idea that he would call totalitarianism for Christ. It's OK if it's for Christ. Um, and two, uh, embracing this idea of secrecy. Again, th there's nothing conspiratorial about it. It's this idea of elites know best. As he said, he says, what I'm trying to do with this organization is create a space for politicians and businessmen to get together and make the decisions that need to be made for Christ, as he put it, beyond the din of the vox populi, beyond the voice of the people. Um, but he said, what kind, of, what kind of Jesus did he want them to hear there? Well, let me share with you some statements from over the years. I spent a lot of years in their archives. They dumped 600 boxes of documents in the Billy Graham Center archives, um, uh, looking, trying to understand who their Jesus was. Um, and uh, I should say, because this stuff will sound a little sensational before I start, so that no one gets the wrong impression, I'm not talking about neo-Nazis here. I'm talking about people with a very poor choice of metaphor. Um, here's Co speaking. Uh, this is actually a, a sermon you can now hear online. Uh, you, say, hey, you say, hey, you know, Jesus said you got to put him before mother, father, brother, sister. And that is, of course, a scriptural citation. Here's how Co interprets it. Hitler, Lenin, Mao, that's what they taught the kids. Mao even had the kids killing their own mother and father, but it wasn't murder. It was for building the new nation, the new kingdom. Again, just to remember, I'm not talking about neo-Nazis. I'm talking about the fetishization of strength. I once, um, speaking to some men in the organization, uh, uh, said, you know, I'm, I'm really bothered by this Hitler metaphor. Uh, and they said, no, 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 no. It's not the ends we admire, it's the means. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and in their defense, they seem a little, uh, a little foggy on what those means were. Here's uh, a leader in the group thanking Co for Co had would often encourage leaders to study the Third Reich, study its you know read the rise and fall. Uh, here's one man thanking him for that sort of course. He says, Doug, what a lesson in vision and perspective. Nazism started with seven guys around a table in the back of an old German beer hall. The world has been shaped so drastically by a few men who want it such and so. How we need this same kind of stuff as a Hitler or a Lenin. That is for Jesus, of course. Um, uh, I sat in on one spiritual counseling session myself with co-advising Congressman Todd Teahart of Kansas, uh, who had been more of a traditional fundamentalist, that he needed to have a more expansive view of Jesus. Uh, to think of Jesus is just to look at the power emu uh, modeled by Hitler, Lenin, Ho Chi Minh, and even bin Laden. All terrible men, he says, but what if we could have that same kind of stuff for Jesus? Uh, again, they're not neo-Nazis. Uh, they're not certainly not uh, admirers of bin Laden. Um, they are folks who have turned the gospel upside down, you might say, uh, and found a model of, of power rather than strength. Now, uh, one man, uh, when we did the NBC segment, came forward. They don't like publicity, but he thought, this is pretty bad. This looks bad for us. Uh, we'd gotten video of, of co advising politicians to form a friendship like that great partnership of Hitler, Goebbels, and Himmler. Look at all they were able to achieve. What if you had that same brotherhood? Um, one man came forward and said, look, you know, don't misunderstand us. It's just a metaphor. Um, and you just have to ask, is there no better metaphor for Jesus than Hitler? Um, is it perhaps time to revisit the seminary? Uh, uh, there are so many other possibilities, a lamb or a lion. Why must we turn to these strong men? Co explains, Jesus says, you have to put me before other people and you have to put me before yourself. That was uh, the same idea. This is, uh, to give, I, I want to emphasize this because I want to make clear this is not a one-off thing. This is boilerplate. Hitler, that was the demand of the Nazi party. You have to put the Nazi party and its objectives in front of your own life and head of other people. I've seen pictures of young men in, in the Red Guard of China. 
a table laid out like a butcher table. They would bring in this young man's mother and father, lay her head on the table with a basket on the end. He would take an ax and cut her head off. They have to put the purposes of the Red Guard ahead of the mother, father, brother, sister, their own life. Uh, this sermon, by the way, which was to a group of evangelical leaders, some of whom were horrified. Um, uh, uh, you can, there is video that you can now find online. You can see the, the sort of the, the, the rhetoric. He's at this point, he's making a fist. He says, that was a covenant, a pledge. That was what Jesus said. If you do not put me before your, mother, your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, you cannot be my disciple. If you're going to have any movement that moves men and movements, you have to have that kind of commitment. Jesus knew that. That's the way the social order is run. So in search of this social order, uh, as I said, I went into their archives. And let me just share with you a few uh, quickly some sort of uh, uh, a brief history of this movement, this um, uh, uh, at one point described as the avant-garde of fundamentalism, an avant-garde in the political sense, not the artistic sense. Um, not, the, not pulpit pounders, not Bible thumpers, um, but a group that begins in 1935 when the founder um, who had become a prominent minister in the Northwest, a man named uh, Abraham Verady, but had uh, grown despairing. He um, had seen the growing power of labor organizations in that period, and, and he thought that they were satanic. Um, and uh, he thought that the Great Depression was a punishment from God uh, on, on the United States for our attempts to regulate the market. And he thought that the church as it was constituted was too feminized to stand in opposition. And so he prayed for a sign. And one night in April 1935, as he relates it, um, and this became the sort of the founding myth of the organization, God came to him, not a voice, but actually God's presence in his room, and told him that Christianity had, in effect, been getting it wrong for 2,000 years, focusing on the poor, the suffering, the down and out, that God was calling him to instead be a missionary to those whom he would come to call the up and out, the top men, the key men. Um, very next day, he organized 19 leading businessmen. He was in Seattle. And he said, uh, in effect, pretty quickly, anyone have a message from Jesus that God has called uh, them to be uh, put in power? A young lawyer named Arthur Langley says, I, I think I'm hearing that. Um, and uh, he became governor. Um, despite some odds, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party both denounced him as a fascist. Um, they were tipped off by uh, uh, part of his campaign, campaign team, the New Order of Cincinnatus. They wore matching white shirts, green hats, and did a sea hail salute until, and this is my favorite document in the archives, they had a meeting and they decided that the sea hail was too fascist. They underlined the two. They were looking for just, you know, you got to hit that, hit your stride there. But he didn't govern. He governed as a conservative. And I think that's one of the lessons that you sort of learn about these sort of insurgent conservative movements is that when they get into power, there is a moderating influence, and so that can be reassuring. But then that also sort of directs us into thinking, well, what is the thrust of these movements, really? Is this the kind of alarming, sensational stuff, the Tea Party stuff? Or is this the larger movement of sort of shifting the spectrum rightward? And I think that's what happened with the family uh, 1942, based on their success in the West Coast. They moved to Washington, uh, held a meeting uh, uh, sponsored by the National Association of Manufacturers, brought together. Uh, about 74 congressmen who liked this idea that fighting the New Deal was a, a kind of uh, biblical calling. Um, uh, by 1946, they were going overseas. Uh, Verady had managed to uh, wrangle a, a sort of a letter of introduction from the State Department, encouraging him to go and scour the Allied prisons, looking for uh, war criminals who are willing to switch out their allegiance from the Fuhrer to our father um, and become part of uh, what he saw as the new, what he was already then calling World War III with communism. Uh, he, he was on to the Cold War before most. Um, 1959 is when they really began sort of reaching out in, in more of a foreign affairs. Until then, they had a sort of a, a, a hold in Europe, but it was much more sort of a polite thing. In 1959, they started taking an active role uh, maybe one of the first efforts was in Haiti when two senators uh, uh, led a delegation of uh, businessmen uh, to Haiti to, to interview uh, a young leader there they thought was promising and perhaps someone that they could become champions of in the Senate, someone that perhaps the United States could direct foreign aid to. And they spoke to this man and they came back and they said, he's, he's not only a man of God, we believe he's chosen by God to save this nation from communism. His name was Papa Doc Duvalier. Um, an odd choice to be called man of God, since as some of you may know, Papa Doc was uh, 
a lunatic killer who believed that he was God. Um, but uh, uh, the United States began supporting him. I don't want to suggest that that would not have happened without this organization. I don't want to suggest that they're puppet masters, rather that they provide the theology uh, at a certain moment for the Cold War, the, the religious justification that allows men to align themselves uh, with some of the world's worst killers that they see in their interest and feel like they're doing the right thing. Such was the case again in 1966 when Suharto came to power in Indonesia uh, through a coup. Uh, the, the CIA, no bastion of leftist thought, called one of the worst mass killings of the 20th century. The family called it a spiritual revolution and began sending delegations of congressmen and oilmen who uh, embraced uh, the dictator again as God's man for Indonesia. Now, Saharto, of course, was a Muslim, but he was willing to pray to Jesus in exchange for this access. In fact, he said, in this way, no one converts us, we convert ourselves. Um, and uh, a memo from uh, Senator Mark Hatfield, not a far right figure, uh, sort of a centrist Republican, uh, to President Nixon, uh, he explains that Suharto has indicated that he would like to deal with the United States through this back channel provided by this religious connection. Um, and so this model uh, was repeated uh, throughout the world. Uh, in Brazil, where this traditionally Protestant organization began uh, uh, embracing Catholics, which was a much bigger step for them than embracing Muslims at that time, um, uh, the, there was a, uh, a secession of generals running Brazil and uh, for whom they arranged prayer breakfast. Um, uh, you get into the 70s and 80s. Uh, as the Los Angeles Times, which did a terrific investigation in this group, documented, um, they became uh, one of the many middleman organizations between the Reagan administration and some of the more reactionary forces in Central America. Um, they organized a prayer breakfast that would become lobbying festivals for Park in South Korea and Marcos in the Philippines, of whom they were especially enamored. Uh, uh, even Franco, uh, once they had overcome their opposition to Catholicism, Franco, uh, uh, with whom they, they, in a memo again to Nixon, uh, they said they would be meeting him. Spiritual matters to be discussed include the unresolved negotiations concerning the future of American air and naval bases in Spain. Those are the spiritual matters. Um, one last date, and then I want to sort of move to a very contemporary example to, to wrap it up. Um, in 1983, uh, Somalia. Um, in Somalia, there was a leader named Saad Barre, uh, again, unlikely likely candidate for evangelism, uh, described himself as a Quranic Marxist. Um, but in, essentially, he was a strong man. The Soviet, he'd been a Soviet client. The Soviets had dumped him. He needed a new patron. He reached out uh, to this organization, uh, specifically to Senator Chuck Grassley, um, who uh, is sincere in his faith. I don't want to suggest that there's anything sinister about this. Grassley really thought he was having a good effect. Saad Bari, however, was one of the most candid of all the leaders. Um, and, I, and I go into his story in some depth in the book because the documents are so are so blunt. Uh, he says he's willing to pray to Jesus. In return, he wants his uh, defense budget doubled. He wants meetings with the White House, and he wants a hands-off policy while he uh, cracks down on a rebel group in the North. He writes, he says, this is wonderful, Saad Barre in the USA. This is going to be our great relationship. Uh, we're going to do it through Jesus. And in closing, the Pentagon has a list of priorities of the most needed military equipment to fulfill this fellowship. He cracked down on the rebel group in the North. And then he found one in the South, the West, the East, the center. He waged a war of biblical proportions against his own people, from which Somalia has not recovered to this day. So when this book came out in 2008, um, that was a story that was, to me, the most horrifying. So that was a story I tried to talk about with the media. And it got some attention, not that much. I remember one producer said, what's a Somalia? Um, Africa does not really rate. Um, uh, and then we had something like a miracle. Now, I should say, this book begins with a period I spent living with the group. And because it's a kind of it's a, a very watered down Calvinism, once you're part of the elect, you are always sort of part of the elect. I remain a brother of the family, a bad brother, but I'm a brother. So I like to think that, that John Ensign and Mark Sanford were sitting around and seeing the book wasn't taking off. How can we help Brother Jeff? <laughs> you know? 
I, uh, I, I like to give credit where it's due. My first thanks must go to Mark Sanford, his acknowledgement, uh, acknowledgements, John Ensign, and Chip Pickering, who ensured that my last book, The Family, would find a second life in paperback and lead to an opportunity to follow up with this contemporary investigation. I thought about sending them flowers. This book will have to do. Um, in the beginning, I didn't want to write about it. Uh, Ensign announced his affair. Editor said, you want to do a magazine piece? And I said, no, I've said my, my thing on it. Sanford, same thing. It wasn't until Sanford invoked the King David story as a justification for why he was going to stay in office, even though he'd called on Clinton to resign in similar circumstances. He said he was like King David. Now, you remember your Bible stories. King David was not always such a peach. There was moments, uh, for instance, when he seduces Bathsheba and then arranges to have her husband sent to the front lines so he'll be killed and moved out of the way. And yet he's still chosen for leadership. Now, we're talking about the Bible here, not contemporary politics, but Mark Sanford sees no need to draw the line. He says he's like King David. He has been not so much elected as selected by God. Well, that was such a core teaching of the family in my experience. I said, I can't believe someone's publicly invoking this. Uh, I decided to return to it. The other thing that brought me back was, that because this book was doing well, um, uh, I was very lucky. People were coming, instead of having to dig into archives, people were coming to me with, with, with documents. Former members of the association, whistleblowers, uh, uh, sharing with me stories. So I realized that where here I'd written a history, now it was an opportunity to sort of write the contemporary story. What is this group doing in the world? To start with these sex scandals, but to follow the ideas, the money, but also more importantly, the ideas out into the world. For instance, I took Senator Coburn, who played that role in the Ensign scandal. What else has Senator Coburn been doing? Uh, started looking at his travel records. Uh, uh, discovered that he had been going to Lebanon um, representing the family. Been going to Lebanon on the family's dime. They spent a lot of money subsidizing foreign travel for congressmen, and also on your dime. Sometimes he would travel, uh, charge his missionary trips to the United States. Where, so I reached out to the Lebanese politicians he was speaking with, um, and I discovered something kind of remarkable. I said, what did Senator Coburn share with you? He was there uh, last spring, in, uh, or spring of 2009. Arrived at around the same time, by the way, a big shipment of US tanks as part of our $410 million military aid uh, uh, program for that tinderbox of a country, divided so, so precariously between Christians and, and Muslims. Uh, uh, he went there to explain to them, um, uh, here is a U.S. senator, um, that he has a solution for the Middle East conflict. And he would like these, uh, these Muslim politicians to embrace it. The solution is Jesus. Here is a man who is essentially hijacking U.S. foreign policy, going, and in their eyes, as a representative of U.S. foreign policy. He told them that he forgives Muslims because they're not all bad, and then he wants them to reconcile uh, with Israel through Jesus. Uh, a number of politicians uh, and that I spoke with uh, found this uh, a good idea for in, when politicians and businessmen. Samir Crady, very big, uh, powerful businessman there, said, I, I embrace this idea. I've worked with a the family. Uh, they helped me get contracts from around the world. I've learned the gospel approach to business. 85% profit for you, 15% for the poor. Um, and uh, uh, they started calling themselves in private Messianic Muslims. This is uh, like Jews for Jesus. It's got to have alliteration. Messianic Muslims, Jews for Jesus. Um, uh, and they were encouraged to keep calling themselves Muslims in politics. And they still do. I think of Ms. Adab, a very uh, influential member of parliament there. Um, when talking to Americans, he says, I've become a follower of Jesus. When talking to his public, he says, I'm a Muslim. Um, and that's how he's elected. It's dishonest politics. Um, the man who came up with this idea, former Congressman Mark Siljander, who I mentioned before, pled guilty. Uh, his, his, one of his areas of focus was the Sudan. He went over to meet with Omar al-Bashir, the first sitting head of state indicted for genocide. Um, uh, Bashir, uh, ostensibly a Muslim, read Siljander right and said, yeah, let's pray to Jesus together. As Siljander testified when he came back and started talking about this on Christian right television and radio, he said, Bashir just melted my heart melted my heart. And he says, you know, I realized that we need to love this brother. And we need to love this brother by doing business with this brother. We can't have sanctions on this oil-rich nation. Yes, I know there was that trouble in Darfur. Things got out of hand there. But Siljander wants to love, or, or Bashir wants to love Jesus. And he became uh, an advocate against sanctions until the US government discovered that he was being 
uh, paid illegally by a Sudan cartoon-based organization um, that was funneling the money through the family's nonprofit uh, organizations. Uh, just last week, the family finally had the headline that they no organization wants to have. Organizer of National Prayer Breakfast receives funds from alleged terrorist organization. Um, it doesn't, it's just not what you want in a campaign season. Um, and, and one more example is, is Jim Inhofe from Oklahoma. Um, I have a soft spot for Jim Inhofe. Uh, he does not for me, but I have a soft spot in my heart for Jim Inhofe because he's so candid about what he does. Uh, at a time when, last year, when congressmen were rushing forward to say, oh, C Street is just a place, it's a personal, spiritual place. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. I hold political meetings there. When we started looking at the foreign travel and they're saying, oh, we're just going overseas uh, on friendship missions. He says, not me. He says, I'm going to promote the political philosophy of Jesus as taught to me by Doug Coe. And he says, and I'm doing it on your dime. He was especially proud of the fact that he did not take money from the family to do this. He charges taxpayers for 20 religious missions that he calls his Jesus thing, uh, flying on military transportation. And as he is very clear, he says, I use my role as a US senator to open the doors of power so I can tell them about Jesus. That's hijacking uh, US foreign policy. One of the places that he has adopted, as he puts it, um, adopted is uh, Uganda, and I want to close with Uganda because it's something that's happening right now, and I think it gives us a case study of the long shadow of American fundamentalism, the danger of unintended consequences, um, and the real risk we have and, and, and blurring so radically these lines between church and state. Uh, in Uganda, uh, where the family's been involved with the current regime, that of a guy named uh, Museveni, since he came to power in 1986, uh, a country to which the United States gives billions in, in foreign aid, very important country for us, uh, essentially our proxy in the region. Uh, in Uganda, one of Inhofe's protégés, a man named David Bahadi, member of parliament, um, who in fact first studied politics here in the United States in Arlington, uh, came to study with a conservative group called the Leadership Institute and made contact with the family like that idea when he went back to Uganda discovered that the family had fostered a, a, a Ugandan C Street, as it were, a, a group of uh, members of parliament who would get together and think about how they could create a leadership led by God for their nation. Um, the idea that Bahati came up with was something called the Anti-Homosexuality Bill. Um, uh, in short, uh, it's the most draconian anti-gay bill in the world, death penalty uh, for serial offenders. If you have uh, gay sex more than once, life imprisonment uh, for one time, seven years in prison for promotion, which is what I'm doing here. And as I went to Uganda, and uh, Bahati is very candid with me, says, I'll be imprisoned if I go back, but until then, we're friends, he says. Um, <laughs> and three years in prison, if you're sitting there, and perhaps you are opposed to homosexuality yourself, um, but three years in prison, if you know a gay person, a neighbor, a coworker, a friend, a relative, and you fail to report that person with tw within 24 hours, three years in prison. This is justified because they have reached the conclusion that homosexuality is a form of genocide against Africa. Um, they believe it is a conspiracy being launched against Africa by the decadent West. They are encouraged in these beliefs by the thoughts of Senator Inhofe and Senator Coburn. Coburn, who has described homosexuality as one of the biggest threats to American democracy. Uh, Inhofe, who is famous uh, or infamous for going on the Senate floor with a perplexing, uh, perplexing display of a, a picture of his extended family, and he wanted everybody to see that there was no homosexuals in, in his extended family. I'm not sure how we could see that, but he wanted us to know. Says he doesn't hire gay people because it's a uh, conflict of interest, although I'm told that there's, um, he, he may not be fully informed on that matter. Um, uh, so I went to Uganda, uh, and I wanted to talk to this, this David Bahadi and talk to him about, at the time, he was being invited to the National Prayer Breakfast. This was sort of a scandal. This year was the first time there was protests at the National Prayer Breakfast, this seemingly ecumenical event actually organized by this sectarian group uh, every year. Um, uh, and I think nobody really sort of realizes who's, who's footing the bill for this thing. Um, uh, and, you know, yeah. When someone has genocide in the mind and invites you over for lunch, you should go because it's bound to be an interesting lunch. Um, you know, unless lunch is you. Um, and so I went over, and, and I have to say, in a really terrifying way that I don't think necessarily speaks well of me, we really hit it off. Um, uh, and I spent a lot of time talking with him, but 
In closing, I want to actually share something from the other side of the story. Now, I want to say, and this is important, Inhofe even has denounced this bill. He says, this goes too far. This isn't what I meant. Um, uh, some of the Americans have been very uh, involved, have been outspoken. That is, after public pressure ramped up. At first, they wouldn't give any comment on it. Senator Sam Brownback still won't denounce it. Um, uh, uh, Bahati claims some Americans are, are still telling them to support him. Inhofe has been a frequent guest over there. John Ashcroft uh, talking about these moral issues. But we do make the distinction. The American family says, hey, this isn't fair. We didn't, this isn't what we meant to happen. We didn't pull the trigger in Uganda. We didn't kill anybody. And I agree, that's absolutely correct. My argument is that they did not pull the trigger, they built the gun. They built the gun, uh, a weaponized idea of Christianity, an idea of a leadership led by God that discards all the most wonderful, loving, and small d democratic traditions of the faith and put it on the table in Uganda and walked away uh, when, when David Bahati picked it up. I want to close by showing what's at stake for some of these people, and I should warn you, uh, this is vulgar. Uh, this is about a person named Victor Mikasa, who is a trans man, born female, living male. Some of you may find that something that you're opposed to, uh, but I hope you will follow with me and, uh, uh, and being dismayed at what happened to Victor Mikasa, born Juliet Mikasa. As a child, Juliet Mikasa knew she was attracted to children of the same sex. She had been raised Catholic, but had joined an American-style Pentecostal church, hoping that in the music and the dancing and the Holy Ghost, the ecstasy, she would find the resolution of her desires. But Juliet Mikasa was not, as, not skilled at leading two lives. She dressed as Victor. She couldn't think dressed like a girl. A pastor determined that she was possessed by a male spirit and asked his flock to help him heal her. I should say, by the way, that uh, in all my interviews, before about 1998 in Uganda, homosexuality was not an issue. Very conservative society, it was taboo but it was no activist thing. Starting about 2003, a huge influx of American pastors talking about culture war, telling these churches you must address this as the big threat to your country. The exorcism took place at the altar in front of a thousand Christians, boys and men from the church's healing ministry laying on hands and speaking in tongues as women in the pews swayed and sang from Akasa's liberation, as the pastor called it, her freedom. They took her arms gently, then firmly, and then they held her and stripped her. Slowly, garment by garment, praying over each piece of demonically infused cloth, she had bound her breasts. They bared them. I cried, and every time I cried, they would call it liberation. They slapped her, but they said it was holy slapping, and when she stood before them, completely naked, the men's hands roaming over her body, they said that was holy too. Then they locked her in a room and raped her for a week. This is known as a corrective, a medical procedure, a cure. When it was all over, the pastor declared that the church had freed Mikasa, and maybe in a sense it had, because Victor Mikasa no longer believed there was a demon inside him. The demons were in that church. Mikasa became a man and an activist, determined to prevent what had happened from him, from, to him from happening again. In 2003, he founded Freedom in Rome, Uganda, an organization for lesbian, bisexual, transgender human rights. In 2005, Ugandan police, led by government officials, raided his house. They didn't find Mikasa, but a friend, Yvonne Oyu, was there. They took her down to the station. They stripped her. You look like a man, they said. We're going to prove you're a woman. It happened again. Mikasa fled, but in hiding and then in exile, he planned. The plan was not lesbian. It was not gay. It was human. It was a citizen's plan. Mikasa sued. And never was a lawsuit more like a gift of the spirit, the romance of the rule of law. And I end there because that's really one of the happy, the very few happy endings available to the story. Mikasa won. Uh, in Uganda, this country where the idea of genocide has been put on simmer, uh, where they're preparing, uh, the killing has already begun, you still can't kick down doors without a search warrant. You still have due process. Um, and I, I find that incredibly inspiring, that romance of the rule of law. Um, and I see Mikasa's courage and and, and taking his case in that form and fighting for it in that way. It is, I'll just close with one line. I spoke of Verity's idea of moving politics beyond the din of the Vox Populi. I end the book with a fundamentalist preacher whom I really admire uh, because he sees his, his role as a spokesman for God, as bringing God into the public square, in demo into democracy. It reminds me of a line from perhaps the worst president in American history, James Buchanan, uh, uh, who, 
didn't have a lot going for him, but in responses to calls at that time for bipartisanship at any cost, at harmony, that we must all be on the same page, he said, I like the noise of democracy, the noise of democracy. So Victor Mikasa brought the noise of democracy, and that to me is a a sign of hope in this otherwise troubling story. Thank you. (laughs) Jeff, let me... Let me start off by going back a little bit in, in American history and suggesting that there are, there are two streams that may or may not be coming together. One is the, the stream of American exceptionalism that we trace back to Jefferson's uh, uh, purchase of, of uh, Louisiana, uh, later manifest destiny, this notion that Americans are a chosen people who need to extend democracy across the continent. Uh, those voices, uh, for many years, stopped at the ocean shores and didn't think uh, on any regular sustained basis about making the whole world democratic. Um, There's been another strain uh, that even though America is a Christian nation, uh, majority Christian nation, it's also largely been tolerant of of other views and uh, has permitted free expressions of, of all kinds of religion. But recently, there's been growing louder a course of voices that really believe that that Christians have the exclusive key to heaven's door. Uh, Do you see these two streams coming together, um, Christian exclusivism and American exceptionalism, and do you see them flowing uh, beyond the borders of America? Yeah, one one of the sort of the interesting moments in this group's history was the end of World War II when the founder said, we're now facing World War III. Um, And he did that almost immediately. And I I should say he foresaw the Cold War before I think a lot of foreign policy thinkers were really thinking in those terms. Um, And he said, it's it's Christian D-Day, as he put it, or as one of the leaders of the group put it, and it's time to fight World War III with Washington as the world's Christian capital. Um, uh, The variation on that that he brings to that, that what, what George describes, I think, might, dis, uh, might kind of pretty well uh, give you the parameters of the mainstream fundamentalism, the kind of ideas, foreign policy ideas. For instance, you would see a group like the Family Research Council um, or James Dobson's focus on the family, both of which are very international perspective. Um, the main variation that this, this movement brought to it um, was a simultaneous sort of expansion, a very expansionist idea, but also a real malleability that, in fact, leads it into conflict with traditional fundamentalists, this idea that you can have Muslim followers of Jesus, uh, Jewish followers of Jesus. They'll welcome anybody who is powerful. They say, we work with power where we can, build new power where we can't. And that's a real theological uh, step beyond even that, that convergence you describe. Uh, one of the leaders of the group in describing to me why they made this choice, I said, we don't mean to be offensive or, you know, imperialist on other people's face. He said, we just use Jesus because he's at the center of every religion. You know, you learn that in Religious Studies 101. And he actually went on. This, I'm not going to name names. This was a a person who was uh, uh, well-placed in two presidential administrations, someone who really should have known better. He said, Jesus is central to Christianity. That's true. Uh, Jesus is central to Islam. Not so much. Um, Jesus does appear in the Quran 110 times, as these guys are fond of, of, of saying people. He is not, but the Quran is not about Jesus, as they claim. But the one that got me was, it says, and Jesus is central to Judaism. And I said, how do you figure? Uh, and he said, because you know how he comes at the end? Uh, and I said, no, no, it actually, it kind of cuts off before that. And he says, but Jews revere Jesus, right? And I said, uh, no, I got to tell you, it's just not really part of the program. Um, and you know, I look at that, and I see that that is, uh, um, I mean, there's a kind of imperial narcissism to that thinking um, that suggests that as you are, in your, in your effort to be loving to other people and open to them, the way you do this is by remaking them in your image, assuming that they believe as you do, and then welcoming them into your fold. Yes, um, I I decided in coming here I was not going to ask a question. But your lecture is so interesting. I had a very short anecdote and a very brief question. One, I was in Port-au-Prince when Papa Doc gave the authority to Baby Doc 
And Eisenhower did not go to Baby Doc's inauguration, but in the harbor were two ships with tanks, machine guns for Baby Doc from the United States. Now the question, are you familiar with the research currently that they're doing about how does a flock of birds or a school of fish change directions? There's the, you look at them and they all go together. How do a thousand birds go one direction or a thousand fish change directions in a split second? And they did research to find out. Are you familiar with that research? I, I'm not, no. Well, they found out that 5% of the group uh, simultaneously change directions with almost unconscious leadership. And I was wondering, the question is, <laughs> where are we in terms of political uh, science or political psychology or political sociology in changing the direction of, of uh, Thomas Jefferson towards fascism and the worship of power? Well, I should say, I, I, I don't see this group as fascist. Um, uh, you know, there's a chapter dedicated to this, this question in this book, the F word. Um, uh, and I think, you know, the reality is this group isn't fascist. They don't, uh, they fetishize strength, but they don't fetishize violence, and that's a key ingredient of, of fascism. Um, I think the more accurate description is, uh, is a fundamentalist activist in Capitol Hill named Reverend Rob Shank, who's, he's sort of like a, a B-list version of these guys, and he really envies them. Um, and he speaks candidly and insightfully because of that. Um, uh, but his criticism, as I said, is that this is the religion of the status quo. They're into living with what is. And I think that's actually a much more revealing uh, way of thinking about the influence of this kind of conservatism. When we think about you know, what's coming, you know, the sort of the Margaret Atwood dystopian tale, we lose track of um, the very small steps by which um, uh, political change often happens. Um, you know, just one small example. Uh, uh, one of the, the, this group is mostly Republican, but there's always Democrats involved as well. Uh, Representative Bart Stupak, uh, a sort of conservative Democrat from Michigan, longtime C Streeter, teamed up with another uh, longtime member of the group named uh, Representative Joe Pitts uh, last year to, to pursue something called the Stu Pack Pitts Amendment, which was an anti abortion amendment to health care. And as most of you probably recall, nearly scuttled the whole deal and certainly made what we ended up with much weaker than it might have otherwise been. He didn't get his amendment passed, but when you go and you look at the, the pro choice groups, um, what they've been monitoring is what they call the stew packing of the states. Uh, the state by state, the same goals that he was trying to achieve uh, are being implemented. Um, now, you may be opposed to abortion, and this may sound like good news to you. Um, there's a, you might want to question how democratic is this? Um, uh, this is sort of, when something's happening, people don't even realize it's happening as a problem. Um, but that, that I see, that's already happened. So. When we go and we monitor this, for instance, reproductive rights now are, uh, have been rolled back to a weaker place than they uh, have been since Roe v. Wade. That's already happened. This is not something that's coming. It's something that's here. We want to think about those changes. So to say how far that is from Thomas Jefferson, boy, that's a, that's a, that's a long history that I couldn't speak to. But I think um, I, would, I would urge us to look for these small steps, to look for these little things like supporting Papa Doc, not being the single deciding factor, but being an influential factor. Um, and I think that's much more the way we get the sense of, of, of how that political transformation takes place. Until you get a big wave like, like we might have this year in 2010, and then of course things can move much quicker. Yeah. Uh, the study on fish and uh, birds was very interesting, but I thought you might like to know there's one on deer that says the opposite. The herd moves democratically. All right. Good, uh, good news from the animal world. Uh, my question is, is this. You said that uh, one of the leaders said uh, the more secret the organization, the more the influence. But you also said it, it's not conspiracy. It sounds a bit like conspiracy to me. I really reject the term conspiracy. One, because, of course, it's a legal term. Uh, it, it perhaps applies to Mark Siljander, who actually pled out to avoid charges of conspiracy. Um, but the people with whom he was working who were paying him did plead guilty to conspiracy. So in that very limited instance, you can talk about that. But conspiracy isn't a useful term. It doesn't, you know, what we're talking about is social movements. And I think uh, 
often people are tempted to look at political transformations not to their liking as a result of conspiracies. And this is the idea that really everybody thinks like I do, I have a common sense, but a few bad guys, maybe it's the Koch brothers, maybe it's Doug Coe or something, are, are, are changing things in an unfair way. And I think, oh, someone have a, an alarm down here? Um, thank you. Um, uh, I think we still have an alarm going off. Maybe we could. Uh, um, uh, it's Doug Coe calling. Um, uh, um, he's monitoring everything. Um, uh, I, 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 and, I, and I think this has sort of been this has been a, a, an argument that I've been in for a long time, and it's it's sometimes kind of frustrating actually. The Boston Globe. Uh, just ran a review of the book, and it had some good things, some bad things, and they said, Jeff Charlotte, headline, Jeff Charlotte sees conspiracy. So I had to send them a correction. I said, here's the, you know, whatever, 10 places in the book where I say explicitly, this is not a conspiracy. This is why conspiracy as a term is not a useful term for understanding political and social transformation. So I got a nice correction, which is, you don't often get in book reviews where they said, due to a reporting error, our total characterization of the book was wrong. Um, <laughs> Every author longs, every author would like a correction like that for book reviews. But um, uh, that's why I think I, it's, you know, that you are entitled to be secretive, by the way. That's not illegal. You, they can do what they're doing. When someone like Siljander runs afoul of the law, that's a problem. But um, uh, I think the best way to understand that is also in the terms they don't, they don't see it as a conspiracy. They see it as a form of humility. They're being secret. Um, they're not calling attention to themselves. They're not grandstanding like Jerry Falwell or Pat Robertson. They're going about, you know, God's business in this quiet way. And, you know, look, there's Quakers in Washington who are approaching things the same way, and Quakerism is not a conspiracy. So no, no conspiracies, but power and influence, and that's important too. Hey, good morning. My name is Miriam, and I am from Argentina. And you didn't mention Argentina. Um, do you know if the family had some protagonists in my country? Um, they may. I should say I mentioned the archives, and I just don't know. It's not. I, I had to sort of choose which countries I was going to look at: um, uh, Indonesia, Somalia, Uganda. Um, uh, I prepared a, a lot of research in Brazil, which I didn't end up writing about. Um, Germany. Uh, East Germany. Um, but in the archives of the Billy Graham Center archives at Wheaton College in Illinois, there's the, the so-called Harvard of Evangelicalism, and it really is a great school and a great archives, and if you want to think about the history of evangelicalism in America, it's the essential place. There's 600 boxes that they dump there. Memos, budgets, membership roles, policy documents, uh, sometimes government classified government documents, some surprising stuff from Chile. Um, and the files are organized by country. Um, one of the things that I've seen is promising is that a number of graduate students have you know, gone out, you know, I'm a journalist writing about this, graduate students taking off one small piece, a country, uh, and a period, and doing that work. I don't know of anyone doing that with Argentina right now, but there, there may be work there. I mean, this is a group that really sees its, its role as international more so than domestic, and so. Uh, thank you. Uh there was a review in a book review in a recent New Yorker magazine about the dangers and the unintended consequences of humanitarian efforts mm -hmm. in some of the countries you have mentioned and in others. Um, and basically, it's if you can keep people, uh, if you can keep children starving, you get more photographs in the newspapers, and then you get more aid, and then you can steal the aid, and go on. Uh, is there any connection in your knowledge between C Street and the major humanitarian efforts that are going on around the world? No, I don't think so. Historically, World Vision, which is the, the big evangelical humanitarian group, and, uh, and you know, uh, you may disagree with some of their religious positions, but they do really good humanitarian work for the most part. Every now and then they've gone over the line and gotten a little confused about are we feeding souls or people, um, but mostly they do great work. In the beginning, they had a lot of connections and they were sort of trading staff and so on. I don't think that goes on anymore. But I think you do see, um, uh, I mean, Uganda is just this case study because it's become this country in which so much religious activity has poured, this country that was so afflicted by Idi Amin and then the war that brought uh, um, uh, Museveni to power. Um, uh, and you see so many people going over there with good intentions and in many ways have accomplished amazing things. It's a revival nation and that religiosity has done very, very important things for the nation. But you also do see just that example that you talk about 
uh, money pouring in, um, you know, and maybe Bahati is a case in point. You know, the family has poured in millions of dollars uh, into leadership academies in Uganda. The idea that we they can take young people uh, and train them up from an early age so that they don't have to go get a, a Tom Coburn when he's already senator. They can they can make their own Tom Coburns. Um, and uh, with, with no intention of doing so. Instead, they made David Bahadi. Um, and I disagree with Tom Coburn. I think his language on death penalty for abortion providers was wildly irresponsible. Um, but David Bahadi is something else altogether. Um, David Bahadi is dangerous. And you see that inadvertent effect. And then the issue becomes, do you take responsibility for it? And the family has kind of, like a lot of these organizations, um, has sort of wavered on that. and. Um, uh, in fact, one bit of correspondence on the Uganda situation, they said, you know, Paramount is managing PR, is protecting their reputation here. They would like that bill to go away, but they're gonna protect the PR. And you see that same kind of effect playing out, unfortunately, in a lot of aid organizations that are more concerned with, you know, the fundraiser they're having in New York or Washington than the starving kids in overseas. Thank you so much for, for your talk. My question, this might be a little bit outside your, your area of research, but I was just curious if there was, you mentioned there were some Democrats involved in the family, conservative Democrats, but I was wondering if there was sort of a, a, a liberal counterpart to this group, um, also spiritually driven, but maybe less so focused on, you know, getting business deals with new leaders or bringing homophobia to Uganda, and, and rather um, focusing more on kind of the social gospel in a divinely inspired banner? That's a great question. And I should say, first of all, there are even some liberal Democrats who are involved in this group. There's always been a few. Um, one was, for instance, Senator, uh, Senator Harold Hughes, very liberal Democrat from Iowa, um, left uh, Congress to work full time for this group. Not the brightest bulb on the porch, I have to say. His unpublished memoirs, the unpublished parts, are in the archives in which you'd learn about his deep investment in ESP and flying saucers. Um, <laughs> just like Dennis Kucinich. Um, but, uh, but he was a liberal, but even then, you know, sometimes like, he became a real champion of Marcos. But even more recently, you know, when they came under pressure, some liberals came forward and said, hey, I know Doug Coe, he's a wonderful guy. Um, and you know, all you can respond to that is, let's not confuse personality with politics. Doug Coe is a very warm, charismatic man. Uh, he's not a monster, he doesn't have horns. Um, uh, he's not a James Dobson. He's a much gentler character. Um, and, and, you know, this is not a question of evil intentions. It's a question of bad consequences. Um, that said, the, the liberal counterpart or, or side, um, I mean, there's a lot of groups. There's uh, Jim Wallace and his Sojourner group, which is, they would like to call themselves the religious left, but since they're more or less anti-gay and anti-choice, I think we would put them not so left, but center, because they're, they're you know, they're invested in healthcare and things like that. And then there's, of course, I mean, I go out and I speak at churches all the time. There's, uh, uh, um, and though there's fundamentalists concerned about this, they don't usually invite me to their churches every now and then. But usually there's liberal churches who uh, are engaged in this. So there's, there is, yeah, there's, there's, there's no organized thing and there's no kind of um, sort of insider circle establishment power because to do that is in itself conservative. If you say, look, we're going to work from the inside within power, you are abandoning the great prophetic tradition of Christianity. And that is my sort of theological critique of this group. They've forgotten the whole prophetic tradition of speaking truth to power, not speaking for power or from power, but challenging power. So you don't see anything quite like this on, on the progressive side of things because they are trying to challenge things as they are. Why do you think humans want so much power? Mm. Um, I think, thank you, that's a good question. Um, you can see, you, 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 you stumped me. Um, uh, um, and I think that again points out to something that sort of understand, those of us who are concerned about the influence of these organizations, um, uh, I think about some of the people I've met in this organization who in many ways would say have very good hearts. I think, for instance, of Senator Chuck Grassley, um, Man of personal integrity. I always think he's from Republican from Iowa. If I ever lose my wallet, I want Chuck Grassley to find it because he will walk from Iowa to, to Dartmouth to get it back to me. On the little things, thumbs up. Um, on the systemic critique, uh, he's a little vaguer. And, and I think when he looks at why he wants power, he wants to do the right thing. Um, he wants to help people. And it's a very seductive idea. It's a very um, tempting idea that if I can get more power, 
I can help people. Well, I can't stop and help people right now because I've got to keep getting more power. If I can just get some more power, then I'm really going to start helping people until sooner or later you discover all you're doing is piling up more and more power. And power becomes the explanation of, of why you do what you do. So um, that's, a, that's maybe a sad answer and a hopeful answer. It's sad because you see how people want to do the right thing and it can go in the wrong direction, but hopeful too because for almost all of these people, it, it comes from a good place, and maybe they can be reminded of that. The author is Jeff Charlotte. The books are The Family and Sea Street. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you.